Hello, I'm Hannah Donner with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Chainjoy is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnerships, calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE partnership webinar, which is titled Climate Change and Heat, Health Effects, Adaptation Strategies, and the Benefits of Mitigation. This will be the first in CHE's four-part series on climate change and health. Our moderator today is Ted Chetler, Science Director of Science and Environmental Health Network. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentations. After the presentations, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on this webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 70 minutes and is being recorded for a call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Ted. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah, and let me extend uh, my welcome to all uh, who have joined us as well today. As uh, Hannah mentioned, this is the first of four webinars on climate change and health impacts. Uh, and the other three uh, are going to be uh, touching on air pollution, extreme weather events, and infectious diseases and their relationship to climate change. So stay tuned for those. Today we're talking about climate change uh, and heat and uh, uh, health impacts. And we have with us three speakers. And what I'm gonna do is introduce uh, each of the three uh, at the outset, and then we'll go right into their presentations. The first uh, speaker is Dr. Greg Wallenius, Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the Brown University School of Public Health and Director of Brown's Center for Environmental Health and Technology. Dr. Wallenius will present a brief summary of the associations between ambient temperatures and birth outcomes. Dr. Wallenius recently served as co-author of the fourth national climate assessment recently published by the US Global Change Research Program and is a member of the Rhode Island Climate Change Coordinating Council Advisory Board. Our second speaker, Dr. Rish Vayanathan, Vayanathan, excuse me for butchering that. Uh, Dr. Vayanathan is a health scientist with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He has been working with the National Center for Environmental Health at CDC for over 14 years. His training and work experience include environmental engineering, epidemiology, data science, and geographic information systems. He has established collaborations with various academic institutions and other federal agencies on efforts to identify and characterize populations vulnerable to adverse health impacts from environmental stressors. He will discuss his publication, Assessment of Extreme Heat and Hospitalizations to Inform Early Warning Systems. <coughs> And our third speaker is Dr. Eunice Lowe, a research associate at the University of Bristol and a member of the Cabot Institute for the Environment. Her exp expertise includes future climate change and changes in extreme weather uh, events with a particular focus on heat waves and their impacts on human health. Eunice received her PhD in atmosphere, oceans and climate from the University of Reading Adding to her background in climate science, she has a track record in science communication. Dr. Lowe will present her research looking at differences in city level heat related mortality between the current three degree centigrade trajectory compared with a two and a 1.5 degree warming scenario. So with that uh, uh, as an introduction, uh, Dr. Wellenius, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ted and Hannah, for your warm welcome and for the invitation to speak to today. And thanks to all of you that have uh, joined the webinar. So my title is probably a little bit more expansive than I can cover in 15 minutes. There's a, a, a large AM or emerging literature quickly getting large on ambient temperature and, and birth outcomes. 
uh, and I'm only going to be able to talk a, about a, a small part of that uh, as relates to, to our uh, recent and ongoing work in this area. So there's a large literature showing that uh, pregnant women are sensitive to, particularly sensitive to environmental exposures. This is true of chemical exposures, air pollution exposures uh, uh, in the medical environment or clinical environment, and that, that it's just becoming clear that uh, this is a sensitive uh, window of susceptibility uh, for environmental impacts and that those impacts are not just on, on the mom uh, during the pregnancy, but then on the pregnancy outcomes and short and long-term health of the child is potentially affected. Uh, two specific birth outcomes that I want to talk about today are the risk of preterm birth and uh, impacts on fetal growth. For preterm birth, it's one of the leading causes of neonat neonatal death and, uh, and child death in uh, particularly children under five years old. It's the leading cause. Uh, and it's associated, again, not just with sort of an acute risk or, or around the peripartum time, but also uh, with long-term impacts on childhood morbidity. Uh, birth weight is a, uh, has a very long history uh, a, a, as a marker of uh, fetal health and, and an important birth outcome that's tracked clinically. It's obviously a marker of fetal growth, and it's predictive of morbidity and mortality throughout the life course. And of course, we've heard a lot, lot about life course epidemiology in recent years and sort of the, the thought that you have these susceptible windows uh, of exposure early in life that then determines uh, uh, your disease risk or, uh, or your health status uh, for potentially setting you on trajectories that last a lifetime. So ambient temperature uh, might increase the risk of preterm birth and also impact fetal growth. There's been a number of studies on this question already and uh, uh, many studies have found that uh, uh, increased risk of, of both preterm birth and, and decreased fetal growth associated with temperature. But the results have been uh, uh, quite variable. So there seems to be uh, uh, variability depending on where you do the study and maybe different methods and approaches to looking at that question. So our objectives were to evaluate the association between days of extreme heat or cold and uh, risk of preterm birth. So that's a sort of short term in, in just the two to four days right before, uh, 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 so two, two to four days of extreme heat uh, or cold, does that lead to triggering of preterm birth? And separately from that, to evaluate the association between temperature throughout pregnancy and markers of fetal growth. So now we're talking about a slightly different time scale, talking about uh, uh, temperature averaged over the whole pregnancy or, or in specific trimesters. So we performed both of these studies within a national data set of US births uh, obtained from the CDC. These were births from 1989 to 2002 in 403 counties uh, in the contiguous US. And these are, are counties that are deemed large enough by the CDC that they could release this information at the, um, at the county level uh, without risk of, of uh, being able to re-identify individuals. Uh, and during this time period across these 400 counties, there's about 32 million singleton births. You can see in the figure on the right, you can see the outlines of, um, of the counties involved. And then the, the bigger outlines are uh, the uh, uh, outlines of the national climate assessment region so that we can look at regional effects as well as national effects. Uh, and then you can also see that we uh, defined um, uh, different climate types uh, according to, to the colors uh, scheme you see on, on the axis there. Uh, we defined preterm birth as the standard definition of a delivery prior to 37 weeks of gestation. And then for looking at patterns of fetal growth, we defined term small for gestational age as those babies uh, in the uh, uh, bottom 10th percentile for term birth weight. So this is amongst term births only. And then term birth weight uh, uh, just as a continuous variable, but also the birth weight z-score, which adjusts or, or accounts for gestational age at the time of birth, again, amongst term births. So we needed, uh, there's a number of ways that, that you can think about what temperature people are, are exposed to. Uh, 
uh, across the country. We chose to use a, an approach uh, that we've described uh, recently. This is the PRISM data set uh, produced by Oregon State University, and it's at a four kilometer resolution. Here you can see one day in one particular location in the Los Angeles uh, County um, on the West Coast, obviously. And so you can see that even within a, a county, each grid cell here is four kilometers by four kilometers. There's quite a bit of variation in temperature even within the county. And what we did is calculated for each county the population weighted average daily uh, mean, max, and, and mean temperature. For today, I'm gonna to focus only on uh, our use of mean daily temperature uh, averaged at the county level. And then in terms of uh, analyses, I'm happy to go into more details if, if there's questions. It's well described in the paper as well. Um, but for the looking at the risk of preterm birth in response to a couple of days of, of extreme weather, uh, we use distributed lag nonlinear models. Uh, these are uh, uh, a, a, a now a well-established framework that allows you to look at uh, uh, multiple days of exposure um, and with a flexible nonlinear framework. Uh, so that's a, a, a described in, in detail there in the paper, obviously. Uh, then for looking at the risk of small for gestational age, now remember the time period we're looking at there is the whole pregnancy or trimester specific averages. So there we just use logistic regression uh, looking for each birth, was it small for gestational age or not, uh, yes or no, and then all models were adjusted for age, race, marital status, education, smoking, alcohol, parity, chronic hypertension, and uh, temporal time trends. Uh, for birth weight, we used a similar approach, except that now uh, birth weight is a continuous uh, outcome, so we use linear regression adjusting for these uh, same factors. So jumping right into the results, uh, what you can see here is that mean temperature in the past four days uh, prior to delivery was associated with a higher risk of preterm birth. Uh, this is about uh, a two and a half or three uh, percent increase in uh, the risk of preterm birth on, um, on, on days of extreme heat. This is the 95th percentile or above compared to the 50th percentile of temperature for that county. And we looked that this effect varies across geographic regions of the country. So these are the national climate assessment regions that um, for the contiguous US that, that we used. And uh, you can see that the strongest associations are seen in the Southwest, uh, in the um, uh, Midwest, and in climate zones that are considered to be hot, dry, or mixed dry. So there's some regional variability, which is interesting to think of how prior studies that have been done in, in smaller locations or across smaller spatial extents uh, uh, might be in part variable because of the differing effects by geography and, and typical weather. Uh, we also looked at whether there was effect modification by uh, 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 individual level characteristics. And so uh, uh, as, as you can see here, and the, the one I wanna point your uh, attention to is that younger women seem to be at greater risk of preterm birth on, on very hot days. And given this association, we can say if this association we're seeing between days of extreme heat and risk of preterm birth, if that is causal, the determination uh, that we need to make based on the totality of evidence, but let's just assume for a second that it is causal. How important is this as a risk factor for preterm birth? And what we've quantified uh, here is the fraction of, of preterm births due to extreme heat, and then here the number of preterm births per million pregnancies uh, for either all of the U.S. in the top row or by region uh, of the U.S. or by climate zone. And so you can see that about 154 per million births, um, there might be a, about 154 preterm births that are attributable to extreme heat if, uh, uh, if these results indicate a causal effect of heat. So moving on to fetal growth, uh, remember we were looking at uh, the uh, uh, temperature uh, during the uh, average temperature across the pregnancy and the risk of small for gestational age. 
And uh, again, we did this in, in percentiles because different counties have different typical weather. And so we wanted to do this relative to the weather that local people are accustomed to. And so uh, when the pregnancies were in, uh, uh, mean temperature in the pregnancies were sort of in the 90th uh, top, you know, top 10th percentile of, of the pregnancies, uh, there was a higher risk uh, that was associated with a higher risk of small for gestational age with uh, no uh, similar effect on, on the cold end of the spectrum. When we broke this in by trimester, uh, so now we see that uh, 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 the association is present for uh, mean temperature during across the third trimester and the second trimester, but not associated with mean temperatures in the first trimester. Uh, similarly, we looked at uh, whether there were regional or climate zone differences in the uh, associations we saw. And here for the risk of SGA, we see a stronger association in the Northeast and the Northwest. And these are regions that are considered to have typically colder weather. So in the cold, very cold uh, and marine environments. Uh, Hand in hand with that, uh, we can look at birth weight. Uh, here we have birth weight Z score. So this is again standardized for gestational age of birth. And here we see that hotter average temperatures during pregnancy are associated with uh, a low, slightly lower birth weight Z score, as well as extreme cold temperatures are associated with slightly lower um, uh, birth weight Z scores. And again, as in for the risk of SGA, the association was uh, most evident in, with re relationship to temperatures in the second trimester and third trimester and not associated with temperatures in the first trimester. Uh, another way to, to look at this is, uh, of course, with sort of model coefficients for, for specific intervals. Uh, and so you can see, particularly, I want to direct your attention to the bottom here, where we have birth weight in grams, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the effect in a, in a number that we can relate to. And so we're talking about uh, pregnancies in the warmest temperature percentile uh, being about 15 grams smaller uh, compared to, to pregnancies in the, in the 40th to 50th percentile of temperatures. So it's, uh, I would describe that as a modest association. So in summary, days of extreme heat, uh, but not extreme cold are associated with higher risk of preterm birth. Pregnancies during warmer periods are associated with higher risk of being born small for gestational age and having lower birth weight. But pregnancies during colder periods, uh, the results weren't as consistent. They may be associated with very slightly lower birth weights, but not with increased risk of small for gestational age. As with all studies, we have strengths and limitations. So our data were limited to those counties I showed you at the beginning that, that were most populous and the data are only available publicly at that geographic resolution through 2002. So we're lacking a finer spatial resolution than county. On the eastern half of the US, that's not such a problem because counties tend to be small. In the western half of the US, counties tend to be uh, quite a bit larger. And so there's a missed opportunity there to do a finer uh, spatial scale analysis. We have no information on uh, what people were doing, uh, uh, whether they moved during the course of their pregnancy or uh, uh, how much time they spend at home versus other locations, or uh, in fact, whether how much time they even spend outside the home, um, as, as is common in this type of population level study. And our date of birth, uh, the date of birth isn't actually available in the data. It's, uh, we imputed it based on the date of the last menstrual period and the reported gestational age. So there's some potential for misclassification of the date of birth in, in both of these studies. On the other hand, we have a very large sample size uh, with information on key individual risk factors uh, and geographic representation across a very large area. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this represents the culmination of work by a number of people, including uh, Dr. Darren Sun, who's the first author on both of the papers represented here, uh, with uh, help and support from a number of other team members and, of course, funding from uh, both government agencies and intramural support from the university. Uh, with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Wallenius. Uh, we're going to move on to Dr. Vaidyanathan's uh, presentation in just a moment here. He's going to pull up his slides. 
Um, and we'll be ready in just a moment. Dr. Vadianathan, can you hear me? Here we are. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, can you guys see my slide? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hannah, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good, good morning, wherever you are. Um, so today I'll be presenting on our work assessing relationships between extreme heat and hospitalizations. Um, basically, the goal was to inform heat early warning systems, and the work presented here was recently published in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And um, just to give a bit of background on our heat health work, um, we first started evaluating definitions of extreme heat events, and basically to operationalize some long-term uh, extreme heat indicators uh, as it relates to climate change. Uh, but then, based on our evaluation of EHE definitions, one thing we noticed was how those definitions using extreme thresholds had poor associations with heat-related health outcomes. I mean, this was uh, particularly evident in colder regions. And uh, this furthered our interest in understanding heat health relationships by various climate regions. And subsequently, when we had a meeting with the National Weather Service, um, you know, we were uh, told about how existing heat alert protocols work and how they use these thresholds and early uh, warning systems for heat. And we also learned that alerts are mostly issued at very high temperatures, even in colder regions. Um, and this was about five years ago. And uh, further in that meeting, we also discussed about the possibility of how the health community can provide some evidence uh, so that um, these epi data or information from uh, epidemiologic analysis could inform existing heat alert products. So our interest also uh, was to sort of look at health risk uh, over a wide range of temperatures, basically to understand what's happening at moderately high uh, heat index or temperature regimes. And um, this schematic reflects our uh, thought process before, if you will, before starting this project. I mean, in a sense, we wanted to generate health evidence uh, based on both mortality and morbidity assessment and also to inform the following aspects. So first, obviously, we wanted to evaluate the existing heat alert criteria. So I know, I mean, it's common knowledge that alerts are issued at extremely high temperatures. I mean, it's been, um, um, you know, discussed fairly consistently now in the public health community. But comparing health risks and alert thresholds uh, was necessary to highlight the disconnect that was prevalent mainly in the weather community. And also, uh, we wanted to estimate attributable health impacts associated with heat, basically looking at measures of excess burden and risk. So sort of the communications, uh, communication aspect of this becomes easier. Um, because like, you know, in the health community, we're used to discussing things based on health risks, relative risks, all that. But then it's easier if you sort of present information by these burden estimates or the excess burden or excess number of deaths or excess number of hospital admissions. Um, and then other aspects we've also uh, looked uh, for our work was, um, you know, exploring health risks by individual characteristics, primarily age, gender, and then also understanding the role of community level predictors. So um, I guess like these are all important things, but, you know, um, our goal was to sort of see how these, all this fits in with our, um, you know, overall scope of informing public health practice. And for today's presentation, I'm just going to be focusing on morbidity-based assessments, primarily, um, you know, looking at how that evidence was used to inform uh, existing heat alert criteria. And uh, before I actually start discussing the data sources and uh, methods, you know, I also want to sort of thank the partners involved in this project. Sort of, um, you know, we were able to leverage existing partnership and establish some new ones. And we thank, we're extremely thankful for the support provided by various organizations. Uh, and then this block diagram reflects various partners that were involved in the project, either as data stewards, subject matter experts, or as stakeholders. And um, in terms of data sources, we were able to put together a comprehensive research data set. Um, with the suite of daily heat metrics from both station and model-based data sources, and also, um, you know, coming up with long-term health data sets for hospital admissions. Uh, so basically, the daily heat metric data we used for this project, we used a model-based uh, data product from the North American Land Data Simulation System. 
so these are graded data products which were then converted to you know match county resolution um, and then they're available for the lower 48 states and then for the hospital admission data we had uh, daily county level health data from 22 states and uh, the data came from agency for healthcare research and quality and uh, and the database that we use from AHRQ was the state inpatient databases. Uh, so the time period for the study, basically determined by the availability of health data, was 2003 to 2012, which is like a substantially long 10-year time period. Uh, and then uh, before I move on, I also want to point out like a uh, majority of those analysis are either conducted by climate regions, which is something that NOAA uses and National Center for Environmental Information uses that, and then also by state. Uh, so, you know, be sort of highlighting sort of the work or the results that we got out of this project by both like climate regions and states. Um, and then um, you're all familiar, um, I guess, like with the heat related health outcomes or the pyramid of health effects associated with heat. So, as you all know, like, you know, a lot of um, studies have highlighted the impacts of heat on any of this or all of this outcomes. Uh, but then uh, we decided to go with um, something that's more specific, that's sort of not uh, commonly attempted in health literature, where we're looking at hospital admissions, but then also looking at certain cost-specific outcomes. So we looked at these various, um, you know, cost-specific hospital admissions in addition to all-cost hospital admissions. So some of these may have, uh, you know, there's obviously existing uh, scientific literature points to the, you know, the impact of heat on these outcomes. But then uh, we wanted to see how this sort of varies across climate regions, states, and, you know, even across various popular subpopulations. And then in terms of our analysis framework, uh, we used a two-stage um, uh, heat health, uh, sorry, two-stage analysis to estimate heat health relationships. So the first stage involved a county level time series basically using a quasi poisson regression. And then as Greg mentioned, we also used a distributed lag nonlinear modeling framework. So uh, our analysis was done for the summer months for those 10 year time period. And then the, the reason why we used a DLNM approach was so that we could explore nonlinearity in the exposure response relationship, as well as you know, quantified delayed or extended effects in the lag dimension. So I think, I thought we, we thought both were important. And then the second stage um, involved pooling of county level health risks from the first stage to generate like stable exposure response profiles, and then also measures of excess burden across these various geographic scales. And the graphic in the bottom right, you know, indicates sort of the trade-off that we face when we are conducting and presenting results at finer geographic scale versus, um, you know, generating results that are statistically stable and reliable something that's sort of needed for translating these research findings for public health practice. Uh, and then this chart describes the region-specific exposure response relationships for various hospital admissions. Um, again, like there's a lot to take in and this is sort of presented in the manuscript. Uh, but if you sort of zoom into two different states in those climate regions, say the Northeast and the Southeast climate region, so what you're seeing is sort of the increase in health risks as a function of daily maximum heat index. So, and these are for the various hospital admissions that you're looking at. So um, these, obviously the, the green line here indicates no effect or null effect. And then these percentiles, like these vertical lines indicate the 25th and the 75th percentile. So basically looking at the interquartile range. And then these, uh, these bands, the golden yellow or um, those bands here indicate typical alert temperatures that are used for, um, you know, issuing um, early warnings for heat. So as you can see from both uh, states, the, there is a disconnect between the, you know, the, the heat index ranges that are used for issuing alerts and where you start, start to see the increase in risk sensitivity to heat. And uh, some outcomes, for example, the acute renal failure and uh, fluid and electrolyte imbalance are sort of more sensitive compared to other more chronic outcomes. So um, again, like this varies based on the, the slope, varies based on climate regions. And um, if you sort of translate the information that was presented as risk into excess burden, again, burden which factors in um, sort of the person base of exposure, uh, what you see here is 
completely different. Like, so for example, in New York State, uh, the burden that you notice is, is, is happening mostly in the moderately high heat index value. So by 95, you have almost like 60 to 70% of all the excess burden associated with heat happening. Versus like in Georgia, it's sort of increasing when you hit like something like a 95 degree Fahrenheit for heat index. So again, like, and this um, sort of mimics the person days of exposure, like here, like in the bottom panels, indicate sort of how prevalent those temperatures are in these various states. So regardless of like how you like um, understand these relationship between burden as a function of person days of exposure, one thing we can notice is the alerts that are issued like in these states are fairly high. So for example, in New York state, you notice that the alerts are issued at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And in Georgia, it's even higher, it's at 107 degrees Fahrenheit. So, and then of note, like you notice that a majority of your health burden is occurring at uh, somewhat moderately high heat index values. So what we did was uh, we were able to translate all this information, these measures of excess burden and maybe like a game chart, sort of looking at these um, uh, risk and burden information in the context of sort of what the weather community might be interested in, sort of showing them where you start to see an increase in uh, attributable health impacts associated with heat. So these lines sort of start to um, indicate where you tend to see sort of an increase in burden, uh, significantly uh, positive health burden, and then where it peaks, which is sort of indicated by these checkered boxes. And then sort of also the, the, the gray area and the vertical bar on the right indicates where you uh, typically uh, you know, see heat alerts being issued. So those are the heat index ranges where currently uh, heat alerts are issued. So again, this, our goal for this chart is to sort of express the disconnect that sometimes you see um, in various climate regions between uh, heat index ranges that are sensitive or, so, or sensitive uh, when it comes to health effects and heat index ranges that are associated uh, or that are currently calibrated to be used in early warning systems. So what we did was we uh, summarized all these relationships uh, for every single climate region. And then in the appendix of the paper that was published, we also provide information by state as to like how these um, you know, sensitive uh, heat ranges vary by state within each climate region. So, um, and I think, I don't know if I have enough time, but, uh, but the major findings here uh, that we noticed in this study was you know, the risk sensitivity or the slope and the magnitude of all these cost specific ER outcomes differ across heat related health outcomes, that's one. Also, we noticed that the relationship changes with climate regions. And then um, the next thing that we also, of, that was of interest to primarily the weather community was we started to sort of point out even at moderately high heat index values, uh, say in colder regions, you know, we started to see heat related burden. And then also, you know, comparing that against all the alert ranges used for early warning systems, you know, it sort of expressed sort of the discordance between, um, you know, what's being used for heat alerts versus where, uh, you know, those ranges that are sensitive from a public health standpoint. And then um, also personally, it was uh, very interesting uh, for, for us to use these local epidemiological data to refine heat alert criteria and also to explore like, you know, how the burden, uh, you know, associated with heat varies across a wide uh, spectrum of heat index ranges. And um, so this is sort of a summary of like what we intend to do with this effort. Um, so I guess like, you know, you've seen sort of the aspect that is related to evaluating existing heat alert criteria and then how we're sort of, you know, um, sharing this information with National Weather Service and then um, our work, current work with refinement of these heat alerts. Uh, but there's also other aspects that we want to complete and which we're doing um, as, I know, which, which are ongoing projects. So basically we want to sort of look at burden now and that which will basically improve our preparedness and response capabilities. And then also use this information in a climate context. For example, we would be able to use this information and project burden in a future uh, climate scenario or looking at various climate scenarios and understanding how these exposure re response relationships change. So that's something that we're also planning to do.
Um, and then before I want to conclude, I want to really thank all my co-authors. Um, it was it was great to work with my co-authors um, whose names are underlined in this presentation. Um, you know, I feel very fortunate to have received great input and support from them. And I also want to thank other contributors uh, who provided scientific and or programmatic support for this project. And lastly, here is a link to the article uh, that I mentioned. I think it's available from the webinar page. Um, and then also, you know, it's, it's perfect timing for us to get this article out because I work for the Climate and Health Program at CDC and then we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. So perfect time. With that, um, any questions? Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Vadyanathan for your presentation. Um, we're gonna move into our last presentation with Dr. Lowe, who's gonna discuss her work. And while we're switching over, just let me remind you that there is a Q&A box if, for, for you to uh, enter your uh, questions uh, so we can get to them at the end, thanks. Hi. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, um, so hello, um, I'm Eunice Lowe. Um, I am a climate scientist. So um, it's a different, I have a different background to um, the previous two speakers, which is great because this session is about climate change and health. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about a paper that I published a few months ago, um, which is about how increasing mitigation ambition to meet the Paris Agreement's temperature goals could avoid substantial heat-related mortality in cities in the United States. Sorry, I just... No problem. Right, okay. Um, so um, I just wanted to start the talk by actually talking about climate change. Um, so this is a sentence taken from the fifth assessment report um, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, from six years ago. And back then we already knew that warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. The atmosphere and ocean have both warmed, the amounts of snow and ice have diminished, sea level has risen, and the concentrations of greenhouse gases have increased. Especially for the observed increases in temperatures, um, we are quite very confident that um, it can be attributed to human influences on the climate, i.e. human emissions of greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide. So um, this is a graph taken from the UK Met's office. Um, it shows the global average temperature um, from 1850 um, up to 2018. Um, so 1850 on the left and 2018 recent years on the right here. Um, and we can see that the global average temperature has definitely increased um, um, throughout this period of time. And in fact, the last four years are also the four warmest years on record um, in all surface temperature data sets from around the world. So this graph here have different, has different colors and these show um, data from different national agencies from around the world, including the UK, US, um, European, uh, Europe, and also Japan. And they all agree that the last four years were, are the warmest four years on record. So not only have we um, increased global average temperatures, we as humans have also made heat waves more likely. Um, so a lot of studies um, have looked at the 2003 European heat wave, where maximum temperatures were above 40 degrees Celsius in many parts of, of Europe, including France. Um, so one study found that um, there was a tenfold increase in the reoccurrence frequency of a summer that is as hot as the 2003 European heat wave, just between the decade in the 1990s and a decade in the early 2000s, which is 2003 to 2012. So um, in conditions in the 1990s, um, such a heat wave with, would have happened about one in 52 years, once every 52 years, 
but in the decade um, in 2003 to 2012, the, um, this heat wave would only have happened once every five years. Um, so there was a 10, 10, 10 fold increase in the probability of such an event um, just from the 1990s to the early 2000s. And in a world that doesn't have any human influence, then such a heat wave would only happen once every over a thousand years. And so um, many people unfortunately died during the heat wave. Um, I think um, heat related deaths were over 700 in Paris and over 300 in Greater London. Uh, one study in 2016 found that human induced climate change has increased the risk of heat related mortality in central Paris by 70% and by, um, in, in London by 20%. So we have made um, temperatures, global temperatures to rise. We have, we have made heat waves more likely and we have also increased the risk of heat related mortality in some deadly historical heat waves. Um, and that's because high ambient temperatures are usually associated with increased mortality risks. So, um, Similar to the previous two talks, this is a, an exposure response uh, relationship between temperature and mortality for London, um, found from a distributed lag nonlinear model um, with historical data. Um, so for London, we can see um, the lowest mortality risk happens at around 19.1 degrees Celsius. Um, and any temperatures higher than this threshold are associated with an increase in um, mortality risk. And the common heat-related health risks include heat exhaustion, heat stroke, which can be a medical emergency, and also heart disease. But we have less confidence in the relationship or the direct relationship between lower temperatures, which is the blue uh, curve here, and mortality. So in this talk and in this paper, we focus on um, the heat side of this curve, which uh, we have more confidence about. So with all that, um, knowing that, you know, climate change um, has adverse impacts on human health. And also, if we don't do anything, then um, climate change is going to become more severe in the future. So we have um, these international agreements of the climate um, in Paris called the Paris Agreement. And the main goal of these agreements is to keep a global temperature rise this century to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase even further to one and a half degrees. Um, on the right here, I'm showing an animation by Ed Hawkins. Um, so it shows how temperature, uh, global average temperature has evolved through time. So uh, if we look at it again, um, in the middle is no temperature increase. Um, so that's zero degrees above pre-industrial levels. These are the two Paris Agreement uh, limits. And from 1850 up to 2017, we see these um, temperatures spiraling outwards, so closer and closer to the Paris Agreement's targets. And um, in recent years, 2017 and 2018, we are about one globally one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels already. So we only have half a degree um, to go if we want to limit global warming to one and a half degrees according to the Paris Agreement. So here's a sentence taken from the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report on one and a half degree warming. Um, if global warming was to continue to increase at the current rate, uh, we are likely to reach one and a half degrees between 2030 and 2052. So the window of opportunity to um, mitigate more um, is closing really fast. Um, and also uh, nations that are within the Paris Agreement, which is most nations in the world, um, have put in climate pledges um, to outline their intended climate action for the future. But even if these um, climate pledges are all fulfilled, or if the unconditional pledges at least are all fulfilled, then, and if they don't change, so they don't increase in the future, then um, um, one study found that the, medium, the median estimate of global warming would still be three degrees 
above pre-industrial levels, so higher than the Paris goals. So this graph here is from the IPCC um, one and a half degree report. Um, I just want to highlight um, the last, the, the bar on the right here, which is about heat related morbidity and mortality. So currently 20, 2006 to 2015 is about one degree warmer than pre-industrial levels. That is the gray horizontal bar here. Um, as temperature goes up, so moving upwards in the vertical direction, um, then um, it goes beyond one and a half and two degrees and the impacts on heat related mortality and morbidity um, is getting more severe and more detectable um, as indicated by the color change, um, orange and red being more severe impacts. So with all that background, what I did in my study was to look at um, the heat related um, mortality levels um, on a city level um, in 15 cities in the United States in different um, future warming scenarios. So I have a scenario of one and a half degree warming, which is the more ambitious target of Paris Agreement. I have another scenario of two degree warming, and I've also a scenario of three degrees warming above pre-industrial levels. And I wanted to compare the heat related mortality um, in each city um, in, uh, you know, between these scenarios. So first of all, what I did was that I found the present day relationship between temperature and mortality for all different cities using observed data from, I, th I think, 1987 to year 2000. Um, and these are two examples for New York and Chicago. Um, as you can see above the optimal temperature, which for both of them is around 23 degrees Celsius, um, there's a substantial increase in um, relative risk of mortality associated with higher temperatures. Um, there is a dashed part, dashed line um, in the red area on both of these graphs because in the future under global warming, we're projecting even warmer um, temperatures that are unprecedented. So our data can't show us what the relationship between temperature and mortality would be from the observations. So the dashed parts of these graphs are um, all come from um, extrapolation from the existing data. So first of all, um, I have different climate scenarios and I run them, run these scenarios in different, um, in decadal um, periods. So each run sim climate simulation is 10 year long and I counted how many number of warm days there would be in each scenario. So in this study, I used the three degree scenario as the baseline because this is probably where we are headed given the current national and international climate pledges. And so this graph here shows the uh, number of hot days in a one and a half degree world compared to a three degree world in green color and in a two degree world compared to a three degree baseline in purple color. Um, so they all have negative numbers, meaning that we are, the models are suggesting a reduction in the number of hot days um, in basically all of these cities in both the one and a half and two degree worlds compared to the three degree world. But, but as you can see, um, the green bars or the green ranges are even lower than the purple ones, meaning that the, if we manage to mitigate to the one and a half degree target, then we will expect more reduction. So fewer warm days per decade um, in all of these cities, even compared to the other targets, which is the two degree target. So um, if you look at San Francisco here, um, the median estimate of the reduction in the number of hot days in the one and a half degree world could be about 500 days per decade. So that translates to um, more than a year worth of days um, every 10 years that could turn from a warm day to being a cool day. So um, to um, one of the results that I found was to compare um, the uh, return times of um, heat related mortality um, in a historical heat wave. So in the 1995 Chicago heat wave, um, there were 514 deaths um, and temperature was up to 41 degrees Celsius on some of the days 
and hundreds of young people were hospitalized with heat related illnesses. The elderly also suffered a lot. So 514 deaths happened um, during that event. So if we look at um, how, um, what are the reoccurrence probabilities of such a mortality event in different worlds? Um, under current climate, which is I think 2006 to 2015, so relatively recent, having four, 515, sorry, 514 heat related deaths would only happen once every 28 years, so relatively rare. But if we, um, if global warming reaches one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels, the probability of such a mortality event would become once every about five years. So a lot more likely, a lot more frequent. In a two degree world, this would be even more likely. These mortality events of 514 deaths would happen once every about five years. And if we go up to three degrees warming, which is actually what our current climate pledges are suggesting, then we are kind of expecting 514 heat related deaths um, once every one and a half years. But I have to say that um, these are these differences in heat related deaths across the scenarios are only due to global warming. So I'm not um, accounting for potential adaptation or population changes um, as the globe warms. So we're isolating um, the impacts of rising rises in global average temperature um, to um, on heat related mortality in different cities. So another way of looking at this return period curve, which is very common in attribution studies, um, is to look at a, a certain um, rarity of an event. So I've chosen an extreme event being defined by um, it's coming back once every 30 years. So it's this vertical line here. So all intersections with these this vertical line will give me the um, number of deaths related to a one in 30 year heat event um, in different worlds. So in current climates, once every 30 year, we expect 650 deaths. In a one and a half degree warmer world, um, a one in 30 year event would be warmer already. Um, and so we expect 906 deaths. These are all um, middle estimates. Um, and in, two, in a two degree world, a lot more deaths, over a thousand deaths, and in a three degree world, even more, um, 1,781 heat related deaths associated with a heat wave that comes back once every 30 years. So this is um, a case study for Chicago. Uh, we, look at, we looked at all 15 cities in the United States, and this is a summary figure. Um, these are all number of deaths per 100,000 people, so they're normalized by the population of the cities. Um, so each bubble, the outer circle on each city, um, indicates the number of deaths at three degrees warming. So the larger the circle, the more people per 100,000 people um, are expected to be adversely affected by three degree warming. The middle circle, the size of it, um, indicates how many lives could be saved um, by mitigating three degrees warming down to one and a half degrees. And the inner circle so, um, shows the number of lives that could be saved by mitigating three degree warming down to two degrees warming. So um, global warming and also mitigation has the largest impact on heat related mortality in Miami um, and Detroit and so on. Um, but for all of these cities, we are expecting lives that could be saved um, in a one and a half degree world and a two degree world. And in a one and a half degree world, we could be saving more lives in all of the cities compared to the other targets in the Paris Agreement. So there are other factors that could affect future mortality that I haven't looked at. So this is the limitation of this study. Um, of course, if we have a growing population, an aging population, um, we could have um, a more vulnerable population to um, heat um, or just high exposure just because you have more people. Urbanization can increase um, urban temperatures compared to uh, rural, temp uh, rural areas. So that could exacerbate the impacts of heat waves and heat events. Um, adaptation, on the other hand, could reduce um, the impacts of extreme heat on health 
and also people can actually over time um, start to get used to um, higher temperatures and, and that's something that we didn't look at but we wanted to focus on solely um, the impacts of climate change and also mitigation on um, heat related mortality. So this is the summary slide. Basically, we used present day relationships between temperature and mortality and also future climate simulations to estimate um, how much heat related mortality could be avoided in 15 um, cities in the United States if their current population were exposed to different warmings um, instead of three degrees. Limiting temperature rise to two degrees, which is um, one of the Paris Agreement's threshold would reduce heat related mortality, um, but limiting temperature rise to one and a half degrees, which is the more ambitious target, would be substantially more beneficial than two degrees in relation to heat health. So we do need to have strengthened climate action uh, within the Paris Agreement or outside on all levels, on personal level, on the um, state level, national level, and also international level in order to um, avoid the um, adverse impacts of extreme heat and gl global warming on human health. Um, and that would be the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. Now it's time for our Q&A session. You may type your questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can. Ted, would you like to start reading out one of the questions for us? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentations and thanks for the people who have offered up some questions. Um, here's one that I think probably goes to, to Greg. Um, it, it has to do with environmental justice impact and in mapping, wondering whether you have looked at population level socioeconomic status in study counties. Um, and I would add to that whether or not you were able to look at the impact of air pollution uh, and how its impact on preterm birth, for example, might have affected your findings. I noticed that Rish did say that they had corrected for air pollution, but I didn't see it in yours, Greg. Okay, thanks, Ted. That's uh, both great questions. Uh, let me take the air pollution one first, because that's the one I have an easy answer to. So we did adjust for potential confounding by air pollution, uh, you know, because the temperature and, and air pollution can be correlated. And uh, we did not see uh, that uh, um, the adjusted results or the results further adjusting for air pollution were not substantially different. So, so that reassured us that these are uh, not due to to, temp to air pollution, but we didn't look at the main effect of, of air pollution. There's, of course, a large literature showing that air pollution can uh, uh, be a risk factor both for preterm birth and lower birth weight. Uh, in terms of the socioeconomic piece, I think that's a great question. Our more recent work uh, uh, with a, a, a new postdoc in my group, uh, Keith Spangler, uh, uh, has been looking both in New England initially and, and now nationally at how some of these temperature related health effects are, uh, vary uh, using the CDC's social vulnerability index with, as a marker of, of, of that incorporates socioeconomic status and additional factors. Uh, so uh, I don't have an answer for that yet, but stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, another question that came in is said that uh, one of the problems of, uh, with lowering the heat alert warning level is that if it happens too often, people will ignore it. So even though the health effects can show up at a lower temperature, it may not be lowering, uh, lowering, worth lowering the level. Do you have a comment on that, uh, Rish? Oh, yes. Um, I think uh, that's a great question. Um, is That is definitely true and that often comes up when we discuss this with our weather community uh, and weather partners. So, you know, when you look at watch warnings and advisories, so these are essentially at that particular temperature, the decision is a binary one, right? So whether you issue an alert or issue an advisory or issue a warning. So yes, you know, from that standpoint, yeah, we don't want to like lower that so that like, you know, you have a lot more days as like, you know, a heat alert days. But then what we're trying to do now was to sort of look at a, a graduated uh, alert uh, uh, framework, which is you know, sort of similar to the AQI, where you have different color-coded uh, um, you know, ranges. And also the interventions that we would propose for each of those ranges would be different and attuned to sort of what the impact would be at those 
skills. So that's sort of like our um, way to address that is like, obviously we understand warning fatigue is important. So it would be like more to sort of get the message across that there are like, you know, wide varying public health interventions and not everything requires mobilizing, like say sort of the emergency medical services, but sort of looking at so what personal mitigation strategies you could have. Uh, and then so how we work with the health community to sort of accomplish that. Oh, thank sorry, you. the weather community. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Here's another question that came in. In cities, nighttime temperatures are increasing at a higher rate than daytime temperatures. Are there ways to parse out the data to better account for times of day that are, uh, that where, the, where there are higher risks uh, uh, compared for certain uh, vulnerable populations? For, whom, for whomever would like to tackle that. Yeah, I can, I can take that. Um, uh -huh. So um, yeah, if we have measurements um, of daytime and nighttime temperature, usually within the day you have um, a measurement of maximum temperature of the day and minimum temperature of the day, then um, it is possible if you have data um, to look at the temperature mortality relationship um, or even other responses other than mortality um, in the exposed exposure response relationship and to kind of pass out um, the different impacts of um, daytime and nighttime temperatures on health. Thank you. Here's a question for Greg. Uh, did your group consider adjusting for air conditioning prevalence in different regions among different populations? Thanks. Uh, so it, it's a great idea. So there's two problems. One, that we don't know air conditioning prevalence with great resolution in terms of either space or time. So the uh, American Community Survey or the American Housing Survey, I forget which one, does you know uh, look at air conditioning prevalence uh, uh, in selected cities in selected years. Uh, but there isn't, you know, a really great data set beyond that 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 would give us the resolution. And and also, even within a county, air conditioning prevalence is going to vary quite a bit. And we don't know, you know, with this particular data set, we don't know that. So I think it's a great question and a great point. And I think it's something we want to figure out how to do better. I think there are studies from New York City where they've done survey work and selected cities in California also survey work where where you, they have pretty detailed information. Uh, across both space and time about air conditioning usage. And uh, so, so we looked at those cities to guide our, our science on that, but, but there isn't a, a good national data set available for that. Thanks. Um, uh, another interesting question came in has to do with what, what measures of, of morbidity uh, might we be looking at? Uh, and one suggestion is um, might might we consider taking a closer look at increasing rates of health and learning challenges among children as a function of, uh, uh, of uh, temperature? I do. I remember. I remember seeing a, a very recent news article about children in schools. Uh, yeah. So the, I guess I could comment on that. The, yeah, yeah. So so right. Uh, I I think there's uh, a great deal of interest in studying the health effects of of extreme temperatures on kids, and there's very little data. And I think that's a, an area of interest, perhaps for you know some of the. You know, my colleagues on the presenter side, and I'm sure for many of the audience members, I think it's an active area of research. We just haven't seen a lot of data on, on what are, are the, the health effects. And as that emerges, then the question is, when you think about heat warnings, right now heat warnings are given um, to an entire population, and uh, there's sort of the, the general population warnings, and then uh, for in some occupational settings, there's a different set of criteria and mechanisms for protecting those populations. But really, as we go forward, it, in my mind, it would make sense to think of, uh, okay, the, these are the conditions that are particularly dangerous for kids, uh, in many of which attend schools that are not air-conditioned. Uh, and whereas, you know, maybe other segments of the population aren't 
equally sensitive or or that the precautionary messaging and the actions taken might be different when you're thinking about kids versus elderly versus outdoor workers uh, versus pregnant women. So I think over time, what we're going to see is a, 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 a targeting, a specificity uh, of, of the heat, um, uh, of our efforts to mitigate the, the health impacts of heat. Thank you very much for that. And I think that uh, brings us to the end of our, our time. Uh, I just want to thank uh, all three presenters for uh, wonderful presentations and very thought-provoking uh, uh, data presentation. And I'm going to turn it back to you, Hannah. Great. Thank you so much, Ted. We're approaching the end of our, our today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Che's website soon. And tomorrow, you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. Che's next webinar will take place September 24th and is titled Disrupt Disrupting Cancer, Systemic Problems, Systemic Solutions. To learn more and to RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to Che and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank you, I thank our speakers, Dr. Willenius, Dr. Vadianathan, and Dr. Lowe for taking the time to present today, and to you, Ted, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a great day.